This is Statistics 243 at Berkeley for Monday, October 13th. Okay, so let's go ahead and get started. Um, so we left off with a little last bit of the unit on computer arithmetic and computer numbers last time. And I left you with this challenge, which I motivated as this Bayesian calculation of a predictive density score. Um, and so eventually, after doing some basic manipulations, working on the log scale, we've gotten it down so that this calculation looked like this, where the e to the vj, uh, where the, the vjs were, um, were these guys. Right? So I'm assuming that each of the vjs might be some modestly small negative number. Uh, we add them all together, and we get a moderately large in magnitude negative number that if we tried to exponentiate it, we would underflow, and we get a number less than 1 times 10 to the minus 308. And I said, OK, so um, how would we go ahead and deal with this? And so now I've written out, and I've written out the recapitulation problem, and sometimes it helps to just sort of write it in a different way, and maybe that sort of jogs our, our ideas of, of what to do. So, um, does anybody have any thoughts on what to do with this problem? Aurelian? By the what? Okay. So you're saying somehow look at all these guys and get some measure that's basically in the midpoint of the Okay, so once you get um, once you got the v that was in the mean, what would you then do? I'm just going to pull it out. That would be my back You just want you just want to pull it out. Okay. So let's say we've got e to the v bar, and then you're going to pull that out, and we're going to multiply e to the v one over v bar. Hmm? Minus. Sorry, I'm missing something here. Did you factorize by Yeah. Oh, right. Am I okay? Right. Uh, let's see. So, wait, does that work? Oh, right, right, right. Yeah. It's hard to do math in front of forty people. All right. If I knew how to work with logarithms, I would that would be better. Okay, so um, uh, et cetera, et cetera. Okay, does that look right now? Okay. All right, so now we've still got the one over m. Okay, so I can do this problem, right? Because this is now something like, let's say the mean were minus 10, uh, 22. Um, this is now going to be something like e to the 2 or e to the minus 2 or some number that we can actually, actually exponentiate, right? But what about here? What do I have? I still can't do this, right? So now what do I do? Same thing we always do. Just work on the log scale. Right? So just take the log of this whole thing. And we're just gonna we're just gonna we're just gonna work on the log scale all the time, and that's gonna be the answer that we report at the end of the day. So this will just now since this is products, we're just gonna minus log of uh, um, of m, and we're gonna have v bar, and then we're gonna have um, the log of this sum, which we should be able to do because this is now gonna be doing things like adding up exp of minus two plus exp of minus four plus exp of three and things like that. So that should be a readily 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 doable calculation. Um, okay. Uh, any questions about that?
So oftentimes there are fairly uh, straightforward tricks you can use if you just sort of think about the problem from a different perspective. If you remember that often working on a log scale is the thing to do, um, we can often get around things that on first glance we'd be like, oh, I can't do that calculation because I'm going to overflow or I'm going to underflow. Um, let's see. And it, though the other comment I was going to make is it doesn't have to be V bar and could, for example, have been the maximum of the Vs. And I think actually the maximum might work a little bit better. Um, if you had, you can think about it as if these numbers varied a lot, like say one of them was 1,000 or minus 1,000 and one was minus 2,000 and one was minus 3,000, then what would happen is you probably want to work with the maximum of the Vs. And then some of these terms would, which would still end up becoming zero on the computer, even though they're not really zero. But that, since they're small terms, it wouldn't really matter too much because you're adding this. You're, you're just instead of using a very small number and adding it to a much larger number, you're using zero in the place of that. But that that, that would probably not matter too much in the in the context of the calculation. Um, okay. Any questions or comments before I shift over to the next unit? All right, so I'm going to talk about um, parallelization today. And I have sort of two goals in mind here. Um, one of them is just to give you a sense of sort of the landscape of different kinds of parallelization that people use. And we're not going to be able to go into a lot of depth on some of those aspects of that landscape. Um, but just to give you sort of an overall big picture of it. Um, and then another is to show you some tools that are in R for doing basic parallelization. And then analogs of those tools exist in other languages like MATLAB or Python or things like that. So if you see how it's done in one language, you're very likely to be able to pick it up fairly quickly in another language. And you sort of then know what to go look for in that other language. Um, so I tried to give a little bit. There are probably lots of different ways that you could sort of categorize different kinds of, of parallel processing. This is sort of one perspective on it. Um, which is to divide it into when we're thinking about doing parallel processing on basically on a single machine where there's a single chunk of memory and the different processors on that machine are accessing that same memory versus uh, what would be called distributed memory when you've got basically multiple sort of independent machines they each have their own memory and in order to share information between the different machines you basically have to pass information across the network uh, that's, that's linking together the different machines. So um, we'll talk a little bit about uh, threading um, in a shared memory context. We'll talk about doing sort of multiple process calculations on multiple cores. I won't talk about uh, GPUs. I have a little bit of a, a bit of a comment in here, and there's some um, workshop material from a workshop I gave last spring on GPUs. If you're interested in that, you could take a look at that. I have a link to it. Um, similarly, I'm not really going to talk about sort of traditional high performance computing, which is what this stands for. And this is getting at this idea of passing messages to pass information across different nodes of a, of a, of a, of a, a cluster or a supercomputer. Um, we will talk about this, but we're not going to talk about it until the next unit as it sort of fits into the theme of, of working with large data sets, which is the theme of the next unit. Um, so that, that sort of falls in the context of some of what we're talking about here today, but, um, but I won't say anything about it during this unit. OK, so um, how many of you have actually used any parallel processing in, let's, well, first in R? How many have you used any parallel processing in R? A few of you. And how many have you used parallel processing outside of R? OK, so a few of you. Um, sounds like, looks like not a lot of you. Um, OK, so actually that works well, because the stuff I'm going to present it as is, is at a fairly basic and introductory uh, level. So the first thing is I just want to say a little bit more about sort of a cartoon of distinguishing what's going on between these two situations. Um, and just to sort of, this is sort of a cartoon of what the, what the machine or machines would look like in these cases. So when we're, when we're talking about shared memory processing, we have what we might call a core. And then there's basically some, some, something called the cache, which is basically memory that's very local and close to, in some sense, the the processing unit, which I'm calling a core here. And we'll often, in most cases on a modern computer, even a laptop these days, be working on a machine that has multiple cores or multiple processing units or multiple CPUs. And there's some uh, distinction, and I don't think it's probably all that important for us, between having 
um, a CPU with multiple cores versus having multiple CPUs all on the same machine. And so basically, I'm just going to call all of these things, whether they're on, on one or more CPUs, I'm going to call them all cores. They're basically all, all the, the separate processing units that are on your machine. So we've got some number of these. And then all of them are accessing um, memory. And so there's, a, there's some sort of network on the machine that allows all of the processing units to access the memory. And so the idea is if one of these cores goes in and, and puts a value into a memory location in, in the main memory, uh, the other cores can potentially go grab that value that the, other, that one, the first core changed. Okay, so everybody has access to this memory. So then the contrast is between with distributed memory, what you would basically have is you would have, um, here I'll, I'll call it a processor, um, and again, we'd have some memory that's very close to the processor, um, and then there'd be the main memory, okay. and now we'd have a number of these things, a number of these processors. Each of them has their own memory, so if this guy goes in and changes the value in memory, the, in the memory that's associated with that machine or that processor, this processor isn't going to be able to access that memory unless there's an explicit information passed between the processors. And so that would have to be passed over some sort of network that is linking the various processors. And uh, you could have sort of infinitely many of these things, like some of the supercomputers at the DOE National Labs have 200,000 of these different processors, or tens of thousands, or potentially hundreds of thousands of those processors. Um, but also with modern um, uh, clusters and modern supercomputers, basically this whole thing here, you can basically think of, base of this as basically sort of substituting in here. So each of these little blocks that, are, that make up a cluster or a supercomputer is nowadays basically composed of multi-core single nodes. Okay, so you can either think, so you can think of this as a single machine, but what we think of as a single machine could also be just a single node in a cluster or a supercomputer. So the, what we're thinking of as a machine here could be a node here, and there might be multiple processors or multiple cores here that are all linking to the same memory, but they're not linking to the same memory as when you move from one node to the next node. Okay, so any questions about sort of the big picture at this point? Okay, so this was this example. This is actually a little bit out of date. This Jaguar supercomputer at Oak Ridge has, has 19,000 of these different nodes, and each one of those, um, each one of these nodes has six cores on it and a fair amount of memory associated with it. So then the whole supercomputer is, is something like 200,000 processing cores. Um, okay, so I've basically said all this. Um, and said all that. Okay, the other thing I'll mention here briefly, and I think we'll probably end up doing a bit of this. I'll probably, I'm, I'm working to get some Amazon credits that I can give out to you guys, and then you guys could basically um, use Amazon's EC2 service to basically start up your own virtual machine. And so I haven't quite figured out what I'm going to have you guys try and play around with. But um, basically on Amazon's EC2 or on Google Compute Engine, or there are some other providers of cloud computing, um, you can basically start up your own virtual one of these. So you could go to Amazon and say, I want... Um, four nodes in a little uh, virtual cluster, and each of those nodes might come with, say, two cores or four cores, and so then you have your own little cluster, your own little sort of supercomputer that you can then log into. You log into the master node just like you would SSH into any Linux machine, and you can then start, start work and start jobs and, and, and whatnot on this, uh, this little virtual cluster. And the SCF uh, um, has a Linux cluster as well, and it's basically this sort of setup here. We have four of these nodes. Each of the nodes has, um, no, we have eight of these nodes. Each of the nodes has 32 cores. So we have something like 256 cores across the entire cluster. Okay, so um, let's see. <laughs> 
There's also a distinction between, I didn't really draw this out very carefully in here, between what might be called a master-slave or a master-worker paradigm where you have sort of one core that's, that's sort of controlling all of the other cores and then you have a bunch of worker cores. And the master core basically tells all the workers, go get started on this calculation. The workers spin away and do the calculation. And at the end of the day, the master says, okay, give me back all of the results from doing your calculations. And then you have all the results sitting on the master. There's also ways to write parallelized code where you basically say, okay, all of you um, cores start up this one job. And then you must have some way of distinguishing the different cores so that each of the cores can do a distinct component of the work that needs to get done. And there are ways to basically write little if statements and say, and you can sort of query what's the ID of the, of the given uh, core. And once, once the sort of core knows what its ID is, it can then go, go do this chunk of the work. And this other core, which knows that its ID is number two, can do this chunk of the work and that sort of thing. So we're mostly going to be talking about this sort of master worker, master slave paradigm as opposed to that mode of operation, but just to give you the sense that that exists as well. Okay, so the first thing I want to say a little bit about is threading. Um, and basically, threading is, there's not a huge distinction between this idea of having doing threading and doing multi-core processing. Um, you can sort of think of the different threads of a, calc of a threaded calculation as being uh, what people call sometimes refer to as lightweight processes. Um, and so basically the idea is your, your code is, is, is marching along. Maybe you've got some R code that's running. And then it reaches a point and it basically splits the task into a bunch of different threads. Those go off and do the work and then the results get collected back together. And if you look at this from, say, top on a Linux machine to see what the different processes that are running are, what you'll see is instead of seeing when at the point when, it's, when the calculation has gotten threaded and sort of branched off, instead of seeing multiple different processes, you'll just see the same single process, but you may see that it's using more than 100% of the CPU, and that's usually an indication that you've got a threaded calculation that's going on. In contrast, when we do uh, something that, so when we have sort of a, a process, when we have a... Um, a calculation where we're using multiple processes, we might be controlling it from the master process, but that master process will basically start up multiple processes. And when we look in top to see what the different processes are, we'll see multiple processes. And we see, so we might see four processes all running at 100%. Um, so that's one sort of way that you can distinguish between these things. In some ways, it's not actually all that critical that we, that we necessarily distinguish between them. So in um, in some softwares, for example, in MATLAB, lots, lots of different kinds of calculations will sort of get threaded behind the scenes for you um, without you having to do anything. In R, that's actually not really the case, and basically more or less the only, maybe the only calculation that will get, that will use threading is if you're using, doing linear algebra. And the reason is not that R is doing any threading, but R is calling behind the scenes something called the basic linear algebra subroutines. And those BLAS subroutines are basically C or Fortran libraries that are getting called from R. And many of the modern versions of the BLAS are written to be done in a threaded way. So um, they're um, written using this protocol called OpenMP. So if you see OpenMP, think threading, because it's, uh, it's a protocol for writing code that will, that will do this sort of splitting of the task into multiple pieces. Um, and so as long, if you're, there are ways to, and on the SCF machines, this is already all set up. In other systems, it might not be set up. But there are ways to have, the, have R linked on the back end to a threaded BLAS instead of to the default BLAS. And if it's linked to a threaded BLAS, then you can potentially take advantage of using multiple cores to do your linear algebra. And since a lot of, a lot of statistical calculations, a lot of data analysis calculations involve matrix factorizations, regression, which behind the scenes involves a matrix factorization, and therefore all involve some sort of linear algebra, this can actually be, be a really big speed up for, for a lot of those kinds of calculations. Um, okay, so I have a little bit of details here. Um, some of the sort of modern and threaded blosses are, there's something called MKL that's provided by Intel, there's something called ACML that's provided by another chip manufacturer, AMD. Apple provides something called Veclib, and then there's something called OpenBLOS, which is sort of an open source um, variant on all of these. Um, and at least on the SCF machines, we make use of two of these. If you have a Mac, um, you can make use of this Veclib BLAS. Um, if you're interested in more information about enabling that on your Mac, 
um, I can help you out with that. So um, uh, we've done it on the Macs on the SCF, um, and so that's something that um, that I could help you do. Okay, so I think what I'll do here is a little bit of a demonstration, and I think I'm going to see where do I want to do this. I think I want to do this uh, on one of the SCF machines because um, it's. I think going to be a bit more clear. It's a little easier for me to see what's going on in top when I'm doing it on a Linux machine. So, uh, let's see. Why is that? All right. Sorry about this. I should have gotten this set up beforehand. I think I usually get, usually I think Air Bears 2 just sort of works for me in this room. Apparently it's not today. Um, okay, so, okay, so I'm on one of the SCF Linux machines, which is a machine called Radagast. It's our sort of our instructional server. If I look at um, this proxy PU file, info file, which I think I mentioned in unit one, it'll show us how many cores this machine has. That's the one way of saying it. So it says, okay, core number zero is an Intel Xeon processor. Um, core number one as well. Core number two, I think this machine has maybe eight cores, maybe 16. So it has eight cores, goes from processor zero up to processor seven. Um, let me try and get this on the same page as the, let's see, as our studio here. Okay, and actually, I think I'm going to start up another terminal so that I can run top and we can see what's going on in top. Okay, so we can see there's basically nothing going on at the moment. There are just some core system processes going on. Um, you can see I'm running top. <laughs> um, but there's not really anything happening here. Okay, so there are basically two ways to control how many uh, cores, i.e. how many threads are going to get used when you're doing one of these uh, threaded calculation. So one way is this package in R that I just became aware of called RHPC BLOSS control. Um, and that will basically allow you to set the number of threads uh, from within R. The other way to do it is to set an environment variable outside of R and then start your R session. So if we set the environment variable outside of R, it's a variable called OMP numThreads. Um, and I don't know if I have it here or not. Um, yeah, so if you're on a, 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 non a Unix but non-Mac machine, um, you can set this environment variable doing something like this, export OMP numThreads. This is saying how many threads to use. And we're within this OpenMP sort of context, which is the protocol that's used for writing this thread code. So this is the protocol that was used for writing these threaded BLOSS uh, linear algebra routines. And so you can set how many cores you want to use. Um, by default, um, it might just go and sort of figure out how many cores there are, there are in the machine. And so it might, it might thread things even if you don't explicitly tell it to use more than one thread. But if you set this to one, then that will, that will, prevent, that will, that will tell the machine, to the, the software, to just use one, uh, to just use one thread. OK, so we're going to go ahead and run this. This is. Um, I'm just going to do a Cholesky decomposition, which we'll talk about quite a bit when we get to the linear algebra unit. Um, but the main, th the main reason I'm doing this is I'm just I'm taking a matrix of 5,000 by 5,000 matrix of random values. When I take that matrix and, tr and transpose it and multiply it by, itself, by itself, I get a positive definite matrix. And if I have a positive definite matrix, I can do this Cholesky matrix factorization. So this is all just to sort of force the machine to do a bunch of intensive linear algebra. And so if I go ahead and um, start up R here and do this, you can see what we'll be able to see if I can uh, get this going here. Okay, so right now, look here, you'll see 382% of CPU. Oh, now it's back, back down to zero. Um, oops. 
I guess I can just uh, copy and paste this again. Okay, so basically this is a sign that we're getting a thread of calculation. You can see we're over 100% of CPU running here, and that's, that's sort of basically a basic thing that you can look for. Um, if we now, this is the equivalent of setting that OMP num threads environment variable to 1. So if I now do, um, do this calculation here, we'll notice a few things. Um, first of all, we should notice that it only goes up to a maximum of right around 100% usage, and we see that here with the CPU um, usage here. The other thing that we'll notice, looks like it's done now, is we can look at the result of doing the system.time. And what you'll see is we're going to contrast the elapsed times here and here. So this was, we used four, four threads, so it was making use basically of four cores. So even though it shows 400% CPU, that's not all happening on one core. That means that, that means that necessarily the calculations are being distributed across four different cores. Um, so basically all of these were active at that, at that time to run this threaded calculation. Um, and so we see that in this case we got a speed up of around three times as much, a little bit more than three times as much. So it's pretty common that we'll see that there's some overhead, that there's some overhead involved and you won't get a full speed up of a fourfold speed up in this case and it'll be somewhat less than that. Um, but in this case it's pretty good. Um, and we could, we could rerun this sometimes to see if this would hold true in repeated uh, uh, uses of this. But oftentimes you'll see that, that this user time is basically sort of the total time across all of the different cores. And we see that that's actually more in that case where we use the threaded calculation than when we just used a single core. And that's a reflection of there's some overhead involved in doing, the, doing this threaded calculation where we're doing a bit more calculation because of the fact that we're splitting it up. And then the result is that the, the total time when we add across the cores is greater, but of course the actual elapsed clock time is less because it's being distributed. Okay, any questions at this point? Okay, let me see what else I want to say here. Um, Okay, so one, th one thing that I'll just comment on to be aware of, because this comes up fairly frequently, is it turns out that with the various different BLOS uh, packages, there are sometimes basically conflicts between the BLOS and some of the other kinds of ways that you can parallelize R code. So sometimes it'll happen that you'll start up um, some parallelized R code and you'll see it just hangs and doesn't keep going. And some of the, so, sometimes the problem is basically that within the parallel code, you're trying to do some linear algebra and there's a conflict and the, linear, the parallel linear algebra um, causes a problem with the other parallelization that you're doing. Um, so it's often a good time, particularly when you're first starting running some, some R code that's, that's parallelized, um, to basically start it running just with a, to, to, to make sure it's not using the thread linear algebra, make sure it works, and then you can turn on the threading and see if it actually improves the speed of things or not. Um, so that's usually a good thing to be aware of. And the other thing is more generally, Thread, the threaded linear algebra works best if you're working with pretty large matrices. So if I have a 5,000 by 5,000 matrix and I do need to do a matrix multiplication or I need to do a matrix factorization, I'm often going to get a pretty good speed up from using threading. If I have a 100 by 100 matrix or a 5 by 5 matrix, it just doesn't make any sense to distribute that calculation across multiple threads, across multiple cores. Because there's going to be some overhead involved in distributing the calculation, and by the time the calculation gets distributed and everything gets set up on the different, in the, for the different threads and the different cores, you could have just done that calculation in serial on one core already in a, in a faster manner. Um, and there's always something called latency, which is basically the cost involved in starting up multiple, uh, multiple processes, or starting up another process. So anytime, that you, anytime you start up another process, process you're going to induce that latency cost, and that's going to be a drawback relative to um, the speed of just doing it in serial. So it's often, for this reason as well, uh, particularly if you're working with smaller matrices, it's usually a good idea to try the calculation without the threading and then see if the threading helps at all. Okay, so that's basically what I wanted to say about threading. Um, now let's turn to calculations where this, the threading is going to happen. As long as you set up uh, the threaded blast and set up R so that it uses the thread blast, you don't need to do anything except you can control the number of threads that get used. Um, but there are also some different ways that we can basically write 
fairly straightforward and simple code to do the parallelization sort of manually ourselves. And that's the, those are the tools I want to show you next. And essentially, all of the tools that we're going to talk about here are tools that rely on having something called an embarrassingly parallel problem. So an embarrassingly parallel problem is when you can basically send off a chunk of the work to one core, send off another chunk to another core, another chunk to another core. They can do all their calculations without talking to each other or without talking to the master, and then they can return the results back to the master. So that's an embarrassingly parallel calculation. It's called embarrassingly parallel because, I don't know, any self-respecting computer scientist thinks it's sort of lame because it doesn't involve anything complicated, so it's embarrassing if you do it, I guess. Um, but for our purposes, those are the best kinds of problems because that means it's going to be easy to do the parallelization. We don't have to do anything complicated. We, just, we don't have to do any complicated management of different processes and communication between the processes. We can just figure out how do we break up our problem into pieces. We send off the calculations. We get the results back, and, 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 and we're done. Um, and it's not, it doesn't even have to be that simple. It could be a calculation where you send off the, result, send off the calculations to the different cores, collect the results back, do something else on the master node, and then send off the next batch of calculations off to the, um, to the workers. So it could be some sort of iterative algorithm. It doesn't mean that you can't collect results back and do something and have that kind of communication. Um, but any, each, chunk, each step of the process would just use this sort of break it up, send it out, get the results back. OK, so what can we do that's embarrassingly parallel? Well, lots of things in statistics are embarrassingly parallel. Anytime we're doing uh, any sort of simulation experiment and where th that we can just break up into to the multiple different replicates of the simulation. Uh, bootstrapping is embarrassingly parallel. Any sort of stratified analysis is going to be embarrassingly parallel. So there are lots of examples of things that are embarrassingly parallel. Um, okay, so if you're going to do this kind of, of parallel processing, what do you need to do? Well, you basically need to have control over multiple different processors so that you can do the calculations. If you're on your own machine, that's simple. You can just start up the tasks, and the only person you're going to bother if you use up all the cores in your machine is yourself, and you know that you're running the job. If you're working on some a system where the, the resources are shared amongst other people, sometimes you'll need to interact with what's called the queuing system, where you basically go in and you say, I'm going to need to use four cores for the next 12 hours to do my work. And so you'll ask, you request those resources, There'll be some mechanism by which you can start your job after you've requested those resources, and then your then your code will basically start up the four different processes, farm out the work, collect the results back. So sometimes you, there's a little bit an, an initial another one of the another step of basically requesting the resources. Okay. Um, so our ideal in an embarrassingly parallel problem is that if we have uh, if we have p different processors that we can solve the problem within one over p of the time because we're just split, hopefully be able to split it up equal amounts of work across each of the processors. Um, but it's not usually that, it, the, even on an embarrassingly parallel problem, it's not usually quite that good. There's usually some cost involved in splitting up the calculation. Um, so one of the things that comes up in thinking about this is load balancing. Um, and so basically, if we've got, say, four cores, we want each of those cores to be active for the entire part of the, the entire calculation. If instead we have two cores that are working for 10 minutes and another two cores that are working for 35 minutes, then we haven't balanced the load of the work across the cores. And this could easily happen if we've got, say, four chunks of work to do, and for some reason two of the chunks of work involve a lot more computation. So that would be a, prob that would be a calculation that wasn't very well load balanced. The other thing that could happen is, suppose this wouldn't really happen on your laptop, probably, although it could happen if you have some other stuff going on, if you're browsing the web on one of the cores and then you've got a core free, um, it could be that one of the core, some of the cores are working more slowly than the other cores, and the result is it takes some of the cores longer to do the work than it does the other, the other cores. Um, so basically, we want to try and come up with um, a situation where we're, where we're load balanced across the different co uh, cores that we have access to. Okay, so one, one solution to this, this problem of load balancing is suppose I only have four cores. If I split up my work into four processes, uh, or four tasks, then I'm going to be subject potentially to this load balancing problem. Maybe for some reason one of the cores is running more slowly, or I'm on a machine where there the cores are different speeds, um, or something like that. And so then then we could be in a poorly load balanced situation. So the other possibility is that I break up the job into more than four tasks, and then basically farm out the the tasks. 
as I farm out four at a time, I wait for, the, any, for any one of those tasks to finish, and then when a task finishes, I farm out the next task of that processor. And so I basically act in this sort of iterative way of, I send out four, I get them back, probably I won't get all four back at once, I'll get back one, and I'll send that one out, and then a second later I'll get back another one, I'll send the fifth, the sixth, the fifth one, and then the sixth one, the seventh one, and the eighth one out, and I'll just work in this sort of iterative fashion. So that can be good for load balancing, um, because even if there's a slow processor, Maybe it, uh, by the end of the day, maybe by the time you've done all your calculation, maybe the slow processor has only done four of the tasks and the fast processor has done eight of the tasks, but they've all been, they've all been working for the same amount of time, basically, and then every, more or less everybody finishes up at the same time. Okay, so that would be good. What, are the, what do you think are the drawbacks to splitting up into many, many small tasks as opposed to just having a few large tasks? Kelly? At some point, uh, the delay involved in communication is going to become even more tougher. So the involved in that seems like kind of straight off between like communication versus using your parallel resources. Yep. Yeah, so that's one thing is, is you know, we could think about the sort of the, um, sort of the extremes of this. One is, is that I have, suppose I have four cores available to me. One extreme is, I only have one task, and I send that task out, and three of the cores are unused. Obviously, that's that's silly and doesn't is not very helpful. So, so the next thing is, oh, well, let's take four ta let's let's try and break it up into four tasks and use the four different cores. And then, as we go to far to one other extreme, I could break it up into thousands and thousands and thousands of tasks. Um, but as Kelly says, there's this latency that we've already mentioned. Each time that you're going to start up one of these processes, there's going to be a, a cost involved to doing that. And you have to communicate the information. You potentially have to send information to that uh, process, and there's going to be a cost involved each time that you do that. Um, one way I sort of think about it is, if you think about like transmitting a bunch of information when you're in, in a conversation with somebody, every time you, you sort of start a conversation with somebody, you have to say, hi, and how are you? And you have to sort of figure out what you're talking about. And then eventually you can sort of transmit the information that you, need, that you need to say to the person, right? So every time you have to start up one of those conversations, there's sort of that cost involved. Um, and then there's also going to be a cost to, you know, how much information do you have to send to each of the, into the, work, each of the workers. So there's the latency, which is sort of the one-time cost of each of the processes starting. And then there's any communication cost of if I'm sending a whole chunk of data over to that, uh, to that process, there's going to be a cost that scales with the amount of data that I'm sending to the node. Um, so oftentimes, in particular in, what, in the for each um, syntax that we'll see in a second, um, what R will do is it's got the, the objects that are sitting in memory that are in the global workspace of the master process. And then when it starts up one of these worker processes, it's going to basically send a copy of all of, that, uh, all of those objects over to the worker so the worker can work on those objects. And you have some control over if all of them get copied over or not, but potentially that could that could be something that happens. Um, so then another cost potentially starting up lots of processes is you might end up sending up over many many copies of the same set of data to into when you start up each of the processes. And so if you have to if you're doing that many times, you might be communicating a lot more information than if you just say start up four of them. Um, so I think those are sort of, I, th I think that's a, f a reasonably good summary of some of the main trade-offs that are involved here and the things to keep in mind when you're, when you're breaking up problems. Um, you sort of want each set of calculations that you're going to do as a single process to be meaty enough to make it worthwhile to start up that process, um, but not so meaty that you're not able to do the load balancing. Okay. Um, so then just as a quick contrast before we see some more code, if you don't have one of these embarrassingly parallel problems, this, the MapReduce Spark Hadoop stuff is basically um, a way of doing um, embarrassingly parallel kinds of problems across a distributed network of machines. Um, in contrast, this MPI stuff is basically what, ha what you have to do if you're in a context where you don't have one of these embarrassingly parallel problems and where the different worker nodes have to transmit information back and forth to each other. So, for example, this comes up if you're working, sometimes you can write matrix linear algebra operations where you might be doing a matrix factorization and you might be able to break up your matrix into, say, nine blocks and each of these blocks is going to get worked on on a separate, in a, on a separate core. Or, uh, well, I guess maybe a separate core is not a good example because I'm talking about distributed uh, memory here. So suppose we're going to farm out the calculations of each of these 
blocks to a different node in our in our cluster. And there can, there's a bunch of calculation that has to go on that's local to each of these. But then the overall matrix factorization actually requires this guy to transmit some information to here, and this guy to transmit some information to here, and so on and so forth. That would involve passing these messages, and that's where things like MPI would, would become involved. And then you have to worry about writing the code to say, OK, process one, send this to process two. Process two, hey, wait until you get this information from process one. Similarly for processes three, four, five. So you basically have to manage all of that communication. You have to manage the sending of the messages, the receiving of the messages. You have to manage telling processor three, hey, wait, don't keep calculating until you get this information that you need from the other processor, for example. So that's the sort of thing that you end up doing when you're using MPI. Um, so in some, in some ways, it's, it's somewhat complicated. But in, it's also the case that there are really only about six to 10 sort of core functions you need to know if you're writing uh, software like that. So we're not going to talk any more about that, but just so you guys know that that, that, base, that that functionality exists. OK, so then what I want to show you is how would you do this, how would you do these sorts of embarrassingly parallel problems in R? Um, so the first one I want to show you is this uh, for each functionality. So this package came out, I don't know, maybe five or eight or 10 years ago. And the idea of for each is it provides you with a common syntax that you basically drop in in replace of a for loop. And what's, what it's going to do is it's going to farm out the different iterations of the for loop to different cores. So you have to make sure, and this comes in, in part by be, being an embarrassingly parallel problem, you have to make sure that you don't, it's not an iterative algorithm, that, that iteration 1 doesn't depend on, iter, or iteration 2 does not depend on iteration 1, iteration 3 does not depend on any of the previous iterations. You have to be able to do those calculations totally independently, and they're just their own calculations. The nice thing about for each is it basically hides sort of the details of how the parallel calculation, the management of the parallel processes is, is happening on the back end. So the basic way you use for each is you say, okay, I want to load in the for each package. I don't know what happened to my B here. <laughs> um, and then there are going to be a bunch of, there are a bunch of different back ends to choose from. So there's something called do parallel, which uses the parallel package as the back end. There's something called doMC, which uses the multi-core package as the back end. And there's something called doMPI that uses rMPI as the back end. So you can use for each in this context where you've got cores that are distributed across different nodes if you use this doMPI uh, back end. But what we're going to see is using um, the do parallel back end, and that's basically equivalent to doing doMC. And that's basically the way that we would use for each in this shared memory context where we have multiple cores on the same machine. Um, okay, so let's go ahead and just see an example of that. So this is going to be kind of a silly calculation. All I'm going to do is I'm going to create a, a function. I'm going to run this function many, many times within my for loop. So I'm just going to uh, have each of the iterations be running this function once. And all this does is take the mean of a bunch of random numbers. So it's a silly calculation, but it's just meant to illustrate uh, so, so that we can see the work going on in, in top. Um, and what do I need to do? I basically need to say, how many cores do I want to use? And then I need to do this registration, which is basically setting up for each to work with the back end. And this is saying, OK, register with the do parallel back end and tell it that, I'm gonna, uh, that I want to use four cores. And so I'm going to go ahead and paste that in. And then here's the syntax. Here's what the syntax looks like. So it's a little bit different than a for loop. It involves this sort of crazy operator here, this percent do par percent. Remember, I don't know if you guys remember from unit four or maybe six, when I defined my own operator, I think it was a percent two percent operator. This is basically what the folks who developed for each are doing, is they are defining their own operator here, just like, just like we saw in that uh, unit. So the syntax is basically this. You have your iterations here. This dot combined says something about the results of, of from the, uh, when, the, when the results get sent back from the workers, how should they get combined into a single R object? And the default, I think, is a list, um, although I think it probably is able to sort of detect in a smart way what the best thing to do is. But this is going to say combine them with the, the usual R concatenate function into a, a, just a simple vector. Um, and then you do the, the percent do part of percent. And here's the block of code. Each, this whole chunk of code is going to get uh, run independently on each of the different for in each of the different processes when for each does the farming out of the work. 
Um, and so each of the different processes is going to have a different value of i, and so you can use that value of i to basically have the behavior of the code be different depending on which iteration you're in if you, if you need to do that. Um, and then I'm just putting in some print statements so we can sort of see what's happening. Um, and then basically, sort of like an R function, if you don't, you know, I, in fact, I don't think you can say return here, but just like an R function, if you don't have a return statement, it's just going to return back the last thing that was the last um, output uh, from the last line. Uh, here I'm just writing out the name of the object, so whatever outsub is, which is the result of running that function, which was that take the mean of a bunch of random numbers, this is going to get sent back to the master process. So I'm going to get one back from the first process, I'm going to get a second back from the second process, a third one. I'm going to get a hundred of these values back that are going to get combined with a concatenate function. And that result is going to be placed in this object called out. Okay, so any questions about the syntax? There's a um, there's sort of similar syntax, well it's not all that similar, but there's sort of analogous syntax in Python. Uh, there's something fairly similar in terms of syntax called par4 in MATLAB, so there's these sorts of parallel for loops exist in, in, in lots of other different languages. Okay, so here's what we can see here. So you can see, okay, it says I'm starting the first four jobs, and then as jobs return, it sends out the next, basically sending out the next job. And so it's sort of working its way through. You can see these aren't necessarily in order. So it says, oh, I finished the, maybe I'll wait till it finishes, otherwise it's going to be a little bit hard to uh, see. But let's also look at the other at top and see what's going on. So here's the distinction from what we would have seen with the threading calculation, what we did see, is now we see four separate processes all running at 100% CPU. So that's an indication that we've started up four different um, processes, and the, each one of those processes is, is, uh, is running along. Um, and you can see that there was, it wasn't as if we started the first four and they came back one, two, three, four, and then we started five, six, seven, eight, and they came back five, six, seven, eight. They came back sort of out of, out of order, just depending on the happenstance of um, which, which processor happened to go a little bit quicker than which other processor, which of the cores happened to go a little bit quicker. And if you had tasks that were, that were different amounts of computation involved, then obviously you'd see the same sort of thing. You know, the fourth one might finish much quicker than the second one, and so on and so forth. Um, Why is 91 Say it again. Yeah, so what happened here? Anybody know? Uh, yeah, so they were sort of starting right around the same time, and they, when, they, when they sort of competed to send the print statement to the screen, they sort of interrupted each other. And so you get this sort of... Uh, so I wasn't doing any sort of... Um, when I wrote the print statement, I didn't have any code in there that says basically do some buffering and make sure you print out the entire statement before you print out the next statement. And so as a result, the, the print statements are sort of getting intertangled in here. So sometimes this will happen if you're, I don't, there might be a way for me to fix this um, in our, in lots of other contexts of doing parallel computing, you could, you could fix this by making sure to sort of put a little, it's called, sometimes it's called putting a barrier in and you basically say a barrier or a lock, put a barrier or a lock in such that I don't get this sort of uh, competition and overwriting. Um, let's see. Okay, so I guess we're running out of time. So I'll, I'll finish up. There's not too much. I don't want to say too much more about this unit. I'll show you basically parallel apply and parallel L apply and parallel S apply statements uh, next time. Um, and then we'll switch over to unit uh, 8. Yeah, sorry about that. It was a little bit weird. Last year I did the Python stuff in class, uh, but this year since Jared's a pro at Python and knows Python much better than I did, we decided to do that in section. So unit 10, which is sort of the Python unit, is material that he's going to go over with you guys today and next Monday.